Well, now we're going to turn to the Matthew text, which you have. And just as a little first point, I'm going to bring out something which is, in a sense, obvious, but I hope that uh, uh, it's worth repeating. We tend to assume that there is a big difference between public and private, and that when we're talking about prayer, essentially we're talking about something public, uh, something private. I'd just like to remind you that at the time of the New Testament, and in this text, the assumption, Jesus' assumption, the assumption of everyone present at the time is that there is only public. <laughs> the notion that there is a separate sphere called private is a very recent modern invention. It's, it goes along with changes of architecture, a whole lots of different changes. Uh, that we live in our, in our modern world, which would not have been available to ancient people. The assumption is that everything is public. What we call private are very temporary abstractions from a normal public way of life, which just enable you, if, if you want to, to take time out so as to come back and be public in a, in a, in a better way. But the assumption is that the notion that there is, on the one hand, public, which is kind of somehow uh, challenging, but also kind of flaky, and where everyone is kind of hypocritical and uh, lots of pretense goes on. And then private, which is where I'm genuine and authentic and real. Uh, this is a modern illusion. In the ancient world, there is public. Private is only a temporary abstraction from public. I think that they were actually much more accurate in their, <laughs> in their understanding of that. And that any genuineness and authentic uh, life was to be lived in the relationships that you have with other people in public. You might need time out in order to be able to recharge, so as to be able to face that in a better way. But it would be a temporary abstraction from public life. So let's, uh, with that as a background, let's just see how this teaching sounds. First of all, beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them. For then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Okay. Well, I hope you notice that what the key phrase which is repeated in terms of the pattern of desire is beware of doing something in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward. The trouble with the people who do something in public, he says, is they have their reward. I don't know whether you've heard this passage read in booming tones by a strong preacher voice, in, in Britain at least, these passages sound much, much better with a, a sort of a deep Calvinist Scots accent. I tell you, ye have your reward. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if we hear it like that, we know very well that the phrase means you're going to hell. <laughs> but, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of a polite preacherly way of, uh, of saying they're going to hell. And I think that's a great mistake to answer like that. He's not saying that at all. He's saying, listen. You act out in public so as to get approval. All of us want approval. That's a perfectly reasonable thing to want. There's none of us that can survive without approval. The trouble is, if you act out in order to get approval, if you say your prayers in public in order to get approval, if you give alms in order to get approval, the trouble is, you'll get the approval. And then you'll stop wanting more. Your capacity to desire will be shortcut short-circuited, because you'll get the good regard of the people around you. And that means that you'll become hooked on what they think of you. You will become a puppet of their desire. 
you will be terribly keen to keep in with their sense, the good reputation that they give you. And you will be, what's the word, seduced into doing all sorts of little pretenses and charades and keeping act up and so on and so forth, so as to keep in with them. Why? Because you're desperate for approval. And the problem is that you get the approval. The really difficult thing is in order to be able to desire more, you'll need to take time out from that. You'll need to be able to step outside the immediacy of receiving who you are from the regard of the social other, which is immediately around you. And that's rather a difficult thing to do. An example of Jesus if you like, himself practicing what he preached here. You remember that there are several occasions in the Gospels where he says, it says he withdrew somewhere to pray. And the interesting thing is that normally, immediately before those instances where he withdraws to pray, he's been involved with a big crowd, and they've been building up to getting excited about him being some sort of Messiah figure. And oops, at that stage, he goes away to pray. Why? because he knows he's running the risk of being infected by their desire. He needs to go into detox. The trouble with any of us is that we're liable to start thinking of ourselves as other people think of us. We're liable to receiving ourselves through the regard of the social other and being satisfied with it, and then acting according to what they want us to be. So he withdraws goes into detox so as to be able to spend time in the presence of his father who sees in secret, so as to be able to let go of being run by the pattern of desire of the social other. There's a similar moment with uh, uh, when Peter, uh, you remember there was the temptation of Peter. Jesus says he's going to go to Jerusalem and uh, be handed over and, and die. And Peter says, not at all, I won't let that happen to you. And Jesus says, uh, get thou behind me, Satan. Very strong words. Jesus is reacting to someone who is attempting to beguile his pattern of desire, who's tempting him to receive his understanding of what he's about from Peter, rather than going through something that's part of someone else's much richer and deeper pattern of desire. We are all liable to be beguiled, drawn in by the pattern of desire of the social other. Do you see how important the longing for approval is that Jesus takes absolutely for granted? In the Senate, that longing for approval can work two ways. Either we can desperately want the approving regard of people so as to feel that we belong, or, and this works just as well for some people, uh, we can be the villain. <laughs> if they hate us, then we must be doing something right. <laughs> Being adulated and being execrated are flip sides of the same coin. <laughs> but both of them mean that our sense of who we are depends on the regard of the other who's around us. So what does Jesus recommend instead of this? He says, this is the little line which we have here, <coughs> but you, whenever you pray, Go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Now, we're used to reading that phrase. When, when, you, when you hear the word room, what room do you think of? Bedroom. bedroom. Most people think bedroom. That, of course, is because we're modern people who have bedrooms, which are <coughs> private places, which we assume are private places, in which we assume that we can go. Of course, ancient bedrooms were not private places. <laughs> <laughs> at all. And in fact, the Greek word is the word corresponding to pantry or larder. It's the little enclosed room on the inside of a house which had walls surrounding it every possible way with no windows. Uh, the only entrance would be the door. And the purpose of the, the pantry or larder being so enclosed was that it would be the room that would be least susceptible to changes of temperature. Remember, if you're living in the ancient Middle Eastern world, you would want something that could store perishable foodstuffs. 
and would be least liable to, uh, to suffer the alterations of cold and, and heat during summer and winter. There was no air conditioning. There was no central heating. <laughs> so you would want something that was going to be uh, able to resist the temperature variation. So there would be a, an innermost room in a house, which is where the perishables would be stored. The whole point of it is that once you're inside it with the door shut, you cannot see out. Nobody can see in. You're about as far away from visibility as possible. The nearest you can ever be to being completely socially dislocated in the ancient world <laughs> is being locked into your pantry or larder. You can act out to your heart's content in the pantry or the larder, and your glorious, adoring public will not be able to see you. <laughs> your hating, execrating public will not be able to see you. In other words, by spending time in the pantry or larder, you're suddenly deprived of your public. The people, if you like, whose imagined responses call forth the you who's usually on stage ain't there. By spending time in the pantry, you're beginning to work through what it's like not to be being run by the regard of the social other. And it's only by working through that, that you're going to be in the space where it's conceivable that the regard of the other other will be able to tell you who you really are, will be able to call you into being. So hence, your father who sees in secret will reward you. He knows you want approval. He knows what you most want is to someone say, yes, yes, well done. We all want that. And Jesus' is teaching is not, you know, you really should stop being so damned infantile and just stop looking for approval. Just get on doing things. You know. The kind of things that would have made perfect gentlemen running the British Empire in the 19th century. <laughs> but uh, Jesus doesn't seem to be interested in potential runners of the British Empire. He, <laughs> he understands that what people really want is approval. What they really need is someone to say, yes, you're wonderful. I love what you're doing. You're such fun to be with. But he's well aware that the social other always approves interestedly their sense of whether we're fun to be with, their sense of we have anything valuable to offer is going to be for their benefit, not for ours. They're going to suck us into forms of behavior, into patterns of belonging that will do good to them, but ultimately, if you like, suck us dry and spit us out. The whole point of spending time in the pantry, in the larder, undergoing the regard of another other is precisely that someone who actually is interested in you, you know who you really are, which you don't yet know, is calling you into being over time, working through these strange patterns of desire. Well, one of the odd things that happen, let's imagine we're spending time in the larder or the pantry. You can perhaps imagine a bit what it's like suddenly my public has all gone. There's no one there to adulate me. There's no one there to execrate me. And one of the things that happens is that you may have experienced this yourself. You begin to detect, after a certain amount of time, to your surprise, that some of the, the voices with which you speak are, in fact, kind of scratched records. For those of you who still remember when there were records that could be scratched. <laughs> <laughs> scratch records, which are really someone else's voice that you've been ventriloquizing. You begin to detect little hints of other voices speaking through you, maybe parental voices, maybe the voices of educators, loved and respected educators, maybe the voices of political leaders, ideological backers, preachers, who knows? But people who, if you like, at a certain stage, you sucked onto their voice as being someone who told you who you were. And as you spend time in the, this interface, if you like, between your desires and the other other, you're able to detect little bits of phoniness, maybe, <laughs> in your own voices. I begin to, gosh, yes, to think that I was fully signed up, committed to being that person. It wasn't really me. I was just in such a panic that I really had to grasp onto a, 
a voice so that I could actually be someone, so that I could have an opinion that made me worthwhile, that made me... But that's not really me. Gosh, I was, I was much too quick to grasp an identity. <laughs> so part of that process of being in the, uh, the larder, the pantry, is what I call the interface between the desire of the other and the voices which have allowed us to be who we think we are. And we're gradually sorting through, letting them go, ceasing to be puppets of their desire, and starting to run the risk of not knowing who I am and trusting that my father, who sees in secret, is bringing a me into being who will really be who I am. Just to give you a, a little example of how, how difficult this process can be and how these patterns of desire work, I'd just like to give you a little example of, if you like, how, how tough it can be for us to allow ourselves to be peaceful with our own desires rather than grasping onto desires that seem good for us. How, peace, how difficult it is to be peaceful with little nudges of desire that might be heading for something, but which we uh, shut down rather quickly because they meet with disapproval of bigger voices that are running around in our head. But we have, here's this little example. Let's imagine that you're a small child, you're little Johnny, little Jennifer. But Johnny is about to go to bed. The parent comes in and says, little Johnny, have you said your prayers? Yes, I have. What did you pray for, little Johnny? I prayed for chocolate pudding tomorrow and for Arsenal to win in the cup final on Saturday. <laughs> oh, no, little Johnny. You shouldn't be praying for things like that. You should be praying for an end to suffering in Bangladesh and for uh, famine relief in uh, wherever there's a big famine at the moment, in, in Darfur. Uh, and you should be praying for the Holy Father's uh, mission intentions for the month of May. Well, you see what's happened to, to poor little Johnny? Poor little Johnny, he had his smelly little desires, which were just the beginnings of him wanting something that was genuinely what he wanted. <laughs> Chocolate pudding and, and Arsenal to win on that. Mm -hmm. And some much bigger voice has come in and told him that his desires are contemptible. And that he should really want much nobler sounding desires. And that if he follows these desires, then he'll grow up and be a good adult. I hope you can see that poor little Johnny is well set on the route to becoming a perfect Puritan. And the perfect Puritan is someone for whom good is boring and naughty is nice. <laughs> He's been taught that he must want good things in public, which are, yep, they're admirable enough, but somehow lack a certain pizzazz. <laughs> <laughs> and then there are things which one rarely wants, which are somehow naughty and ought to be kept under wraps. You see how he's been... In fact, he's been taught St. Matthew's Gospel in reverse. He's been taught how it's exactly the approval of the others in the public square that he needs <laughs> if he's going to desire properly. Instead of being allowed to spend time undergoing the strange business of allowing the smelly little desires to flourish, and the funny thing is, Jesus seems to be very much in favor of the smelly desires. It's the things that we don't quite dare to want to ask for because we're slightly ashamed that maybe we shouldn't really want them. But we really do. But we... That seems to be the space where being, I say, yes, go on, for God's sake, ask for it. <laughs> <laughs> that seems to be where we're being encouraged. And why is it? Is it because... God is constantly wanting us to have frivolous little smelly things. I doubt it. I think it's much more likely that it's, it's only in the degree to which we dare to allow ourselves actually to ask for things that genuinely are what we want, that we're going to be able to grow organically into wanting more and more that's genuinely part of us. The sort of person who is able to, if you like, to desire without shame for chocolate pudding and Arsenal or whatever it is, may in the end, over time, gradually come to see that those things 
aren't so important from his own perspective. And Ranch might actually come to love from within the notion of organizing Médecins Sans Frontières in, uh, in, in Darfur or, uh, or becoming a missionary and satisfying the Holy Father's uh, mission, may, may mission appeal to the power of 10. Um, any number of possible things, but starting from what that person really discovers themselves wanting from within, rather than thinking that they ought to want it because someone good has told them they ought to want it. Do you see the, uh, do you see the thing? That the importance of sitting with smelly desires over time. Okay. And part of what's going on here is the, uh, uh, the magic, if you like, the strange magic of being able to say, I want. Because this is what we're being asked to do in prayer, is to learn to be able to say, I want. Not only in the sense of I'm lacking something, but I, I really would like something. I'm going to dare to express that I want to be found on the inside of a becoming. It's amazing. If you feel that you really do want something, but don't dare to say it, you sort of get into resentment with yourself and everyone else because they ought to know that that's what you want. And um, you know that that's what you want, but you're not going to say it because that would be somehow humiliating. You say, no, the really important thing is when you're finally able to say, I want whatever it is, which means I'm going to dare to allow myself to be found on the inside of becoming whatever that desire turns into. And there's something at the same time very person-building and very humbling about that at the same time, which is part of what this business of prayer is all about. 